Today we are starting a series of lectures on microbiology. So let's start with the very very basic concepts, right? For example, what are the major categories of infectious agents, right? We'll discuss about the different categories of infectious agents. Start with the smallest one. Yeah. Which is the smallest infectious particle? Question goes to someone very bright, Dr. Miguel. Prions. Prions. What are prions? Prions. So Mr. Miguel is telling us the smallest infectious particle is prion. Right? So, Dr. Sunny is going to tell us that prions are having DNA or RNA. Yes, please. They are having DNA. Uh, Dr. Sunny claims that prions have DNA. Anyone who agrees to Dr. Sunny? <laughs> Only Sunny is agreeing to himself. Okay. People who believe prions have RNA raise their hands. Okay. Now listen. People who believe prions have DNA, Sunny is alone. And people who believe that prions have RNA raise their hands. Okay, who is a bird, who is a rainy? You must remember, Sunny is wrong. And you must also remember, who is a bird and who is a rainy are wrong. These are infectious particles which do not have any DNA or RNA. That's a very important thing to remember. They are just protein particles. They have no recognizable molecules of DNA or RNA. I think it must be shocking for you, isn't it? But this is true, that there are infectious particles which do not have any DNA or RNA, but when prions enter your body, for example, if they reach your central nervous system, few prion molecules or few prion particles Eventually, there will be billions of them there. Question is, if prions don't have any DNA or they do not have any RNA, how they increase their number? Yes, Dr. Amon is going to tell us. Prions don't have any DNA, they do not have any RNA, but once prions enter, suppose, in your central nervous system, over the time, they convert into billions and billions of their copies. How their number increases? Yes, Miguel. Okay, okay, that's right. Uh, he's saying that prions enter into our neuron spores and you think that prions will use our genes to make more prions. Uh, no, prions do something like that, but not exactly like that. Let me tell you exactly what happens. Very briefly about prions. Basically, prions related proteins are normal proteins present in our body. Let's suppose here is a neuron. Because prions are producing a group of diseases which are called, let, I will explain how the prions number increases. Right? When they do, they do not have their DNA or RNA. But before that I must tell what type of diseases they are producing. The group of diseases which are produced by the prions, they are called, yes, transmissible, yes, Spongy form, encephalopathies, encephalopathies, right? So how the prions really produce the, increase their copy, let me tell you. Actually, prion related, prion related proteins are normally produced by our cells. Prion related proteins are normally produced by our cells. They are called prion protein from cellular region, PRPC. Prion proteins from our cells. Let me show you. This is your DNA, right? And within your DNA, you are having a gene. And when this gene expresses, it will make messenger RNA 
and that messenger RNA when it is translated it will produce I am talking about normal gene first this normal gene when it will produce messenger RNA it will produce a protein and let's suppose this is that protein right now this protein which is produced of course it is amino acid sequence in a string and they are arranged in a spring or in a coil fashion or such arrangement of peptide chain is called helical arrangement alpha helical arrangement is that right so normally our cells have genes which can produce prion related proteins these cellular prion related proteins right these are arranged in alpha helical arrangement they are arranged like a their peptide chain is in a spring shape am i clear now look at it what are prions which are pathologically abnormal they are the same protein but they are misfolded what are prions these are infectious particles which are the same normal protein but abnormally folded is that right as i told you that normally this protein should be folded in spring i will tell you how exactly normally it is folded this is the arrangement of protein normally but if you misfold this protein the same peptide chain is misfolded and rather than this coiled arrangement rather than this alpha helical arrangement if it is okay i will make with the same color so that you must know now this is a peptide chain that is also a peptide chain a amino acid sequence in both chain is absolutely same it means the primary structure of the protein is absolutely same but this is folded in a coiled fashion and this is folded in a different way and this arrangement is called beta plating what is this arrangement called beta plated arrangement beta plated arrangement so what really happens when normal helical proteins prions right they are beta plated they become abnormal proteins the question is that why this is abnormal why this is able to produce disease is that right answer is that normally in our cells many proteins are being produced and catabolized you know there is a protein turnover going on when genes are producing the proteins enzymes or different structural and functional proteins with the time when those proteins become denatured those proteins are destroyed and they are replaced by more proteins is that right this is a normal protein turnover now it means for normal protein turnover cells should be able to produce the protein as well as should be able to destroy the protein and to destroy these proteins there must be proteolytic enzymes which should be called proteases what should be called the proteases as a group so every cell has proteases which will destroy eventually all denatured proteins am i clear now all the proteases which are present in human cells they work on mainly on the alpha helical arrangement they do not work effectively on beta plating arrangement that is the real concept that the enzymes which are present in our cells or in our tissues which can break down the proteins they break down alpha helical arrangements they cannot break down beta plating is that right now 
if due to any reason in your cell or outside your cell lot of peptide chains are present in beta plating can you catabolize those proteins you cannot should i give you a classical examples you know silk suture do they absorb no why they don't absorb silk is a protein yes megal you never thought of it oh my god silk is produced by the silk worm you know silk is having beta plating that is so simple silk s i l k right has having beta plating arrangement that is why when you put suture with silk our enzymes cannot digest it away they become permanent so look at it what are prions they are something like silk just to have a concept in your mind these are misfolded proteins these are corrupted proteins you know as from some society it's very difficult to root out the corruption in the same way it is very difficult or almost impossible to root out the prions out of the cells because of beta plating is that right no problem up to this do you know any other protein which is beta plating you must have heard of diseases other than prions have you heard of the group of diseases called amyloidosis amyloidosis amyloids what are amyloids have you heard of amyloid of course what is amyloid any protein in your body yes which is beta plated and present extracellularly that protein is called amyloid you are understanding that is why once amyloid start depositing in your tissues you cannot digest it away because they are resistant to proteolytic activity am i clear let's go back to prions now having this basic concept look what are prions now onward i will not make whole this structure i will just show alpha helical arrangement in this way and i will show the beta arrangement in this way now onwards now what are prions prions are basically infectious particle infectious agent what really happen they are beta plated misfolded protein particles you must have heard of something called mad cow disease what was happening there in that disease right in mad cow disease which is also called bovine spongiform encephalopathies mad cow disease bovine spongiform encephalopathy the infectious agent of mad, mad cow disease is prions what was happening that if from the cow meat these prions enter into your body and these prions reach to your central nervous system what will happen look here this is the mad cow disease agent has entered into this neuron right this is pathological particle this is corrupted protein now what this will do normally these genes are expressing and producing normal prion related cellular proteins which are folded in a normal fashion now a corrupt protein come this protein will actually alter the folding of the normal protein how that when look when messenger rna come primary then on the ribosome primary peptide chain is made then you know primary peptide chain enter into endoplasmic reticulum and into golgi operators and in there is modifications going on into endoplasmic reticulum and golgi operators the and during that proteins are appropriately folded and those changes are called post translational modifications of peptide chain what are they called post translational modification of peptide chains because first peptide chain is translated messenger rna is translated into peptide chain after that it undergoes folding now in the presence of beta plated particle now this is a very important concept listen with your both ears in the presence of abnormal pathological prion particles or in the presence of beta plated prion particle the newly formed proteins 
are misfolded as you know in one department as it happens in government department a big corrupt man come and slowly all the department become corrupt what happens even the people who are not corrupt gradually they start becoming corrupt in the same way this is a corrupt protein which enters and it influences the our own naturally normally produced proteins and corrupt them into misfolding and convert them into prions so what really happened this protein and that protein they come together right they come together and in the end you will end up with two what two prions then these two prions will influence two more normal proteins and then you will end up with yes four prions you know mathematics good so four prions so now you understand that we had originally one prion enter into this cell but it started corrupting our own proteins and converting them into pathological beta plated particles and when lot of beta plated particles will accumulate cells cannot digest them and you can say cell become a garbage house right because the number one beta plated these proteins are not functional and number two we cell is unable to digest them and because normal prion proteins are protease sensitive pathological misfolded beta plated prion proteins are protease resistant so what is the real difference protease resistance particles which are pathological protease sensitive particles which are physiological so this pathological particle convert our physiological particles normal particles into corrupted proteins this is what happens into prion the whole purpose of this discussion was that prions are the smallest infectious agent known up to now and they don't have any dna or any rna but still while entering into your body they can increase their number into billions and billions right not by giving their own offsprings rather they just start corrupting your own prion related proteins right this was a little introduction to prions we'll discuss into detail later on about prions okay so and i always remember it's worth remembering and worth repeating that beta plated proteins which are heavily beta plated our body cannot digest them away and pathological conditions related with beta plated protein one is prion related diseases other is amyloidosis right now we come to the next group of infectious agents right who is going to tell me yes please virus i think something before virus okay i will put virus so that you feel somewhat comfortable here this is virus okay something less than a virus can also produce disease in an indirect way or they are responsible now you are shocked why you are looking shocked we are talking about infectious diseases yeah you are i think in romantic love with virus and bacteria there are other things also which produce infections anyone no one want to speak anything some agents which are infectious or directly or indirectly they can produce some infectious problems for us or produce some virulence or produce some disease why don't you, oh he is telling toxins my friend toxins are not infectious agent right we'll talk about those later let me tell you have you heard of something called bacteriophages something called plasmids something called transposons i will explain that right how they are infectious agent 
बैक्टीरियोफेज बैक्टीरियोफेजेस प्लाज्मेट्स प्लाज्मेट्स एंड ट्रांसपोसंस ट्रांसपोसंस लेट लेट मी एक्सप्लेन व्हाट आई रियली मीन बाय दिस लेट्स सपोज टेक एन एग्जांपल ऑफ प्लाज्मेट व्हाट इज प्लाज्मेट व्हाट इज प्लाज्मेट यू नेवर हर्ड ऑफ इट I'm about to die with shock myself. What is plasmid? My God, it's a dangerous situation. Plasmids are usually they are present in bacteria. Let me show you. Here is a bacteria, and I will explain these things in relation to bacteria. Let's suppose here is bacteria, and this is bacterial DNA. right plasmid is this is bacterial chromosome plasmid is extra chromosomal dna double stranded circular dna extra chromosomal this is very important plasmids are extra chromosomal double stranded dna ring which are capable of replicating on their own these are double stranded dna rings circles right and if one plasmid spores enter into this bacteria after some time this there may be maybe 100 plasmids here and then this is another bacteria here is another bacteria let me explain how plasmids affect the disease process bacteria number 1 bacteria number 2 and bacteria number 3 right which is the most abundant organism in the world viagne don't tell me human beings <laughs> which is the most abundant organism in the world megal anyone bacteria you put all the animals and all the plants together and make a big lump bacteria are more than that combined lump in the on the earth right anyway let's come back so what is happening this is bacterial chromosome this is extra chromosomal double stranded dna which has a capacity to replicate on its own for example this chromosome may not replicate but plasmid may keep on replicating independently and make extra copies am i clear to you you understand what is plasmid now what is the clinical relevance of plasmid look here this is i'm just giving you basic idea later on we'll have a full lecture on plasmid right this is just an introduction to microbiology now what happens let us suppose in this plasmid this is a gene in this plasmid let us suppose this is a gene and when this gene expresses a special toxic molecule is produced a special toxin is produced it means if this bacteria is not having that plasmid can this bacteria produce that toxin if this bacteria cannot produce that toxin let us suppose this bacteria is not virulent so now this is a virulent bacteria because this bacteria has a special type of plasmid and plasmid is having a genes to express special type of toxin molecules right so this is a virulent bacteria or bacteria capable of producing disease this is another bacterium which is not having that plasmid and it is not having any other virulence factor so it is not able to produce a disease now you imagine if the plasmids from there transfer here to this bacterium right later on we'll talk how plasmids transfer for a while you just trust me they do transfer if from this bacterium that this plasmid shift to another bacterium and now plasmid come over here so what will happen yes please that now this bacterium will start producing yes please toxins and it will convert into which type of virulent and they will produce the disease and now this this bacteria will be able to produce infection and pathogenicity so 
what happened maybe this bacteria was part of our normal flora it was innocent bacteria in us not producing any disease but as soon as it got the special type of plasmid this bacteria was able to express toxins and produce a disease so this become highly infectious situation so just plasmid can act as an infectious agent but through through bacteria is that right so plasmid can alter the virulence of bacteria for example some other plasmids have other genes and other genes present in plasmid uh, may for example plasmid may have another gene and this plasmid gene when this expresses then the new protein will be made and that protein help the bacteria to stick to our mucosal cells and these proteins are called adhesins what are these adhesins if this plasmid is not there bacteria don't become adherent and don't produce disease when this plasmid is there then they are capable of producing the disease so it means plasmids are related with pathogenicity am i clear either by producing toxins or by producing adhesin molecules am i clear another thing a real real dangerous thing every doctor must know plasmid relationship with the drugs i'm not talking about illicit drugs i'm talking about antibiotics yes what is the relationship of plasmid with the drugs dr jose no idea okay mr vyagne want to tell us something okay very good he say that plasmids may produce resistance against a drug yes he is right sometimes what happen let us suppose this is special type of uh, just tell me what is this antibiotic i have made yeah what is this antibiotic structure please tell me this is penicillin oh my god this is penicillinoic acid ring right and what is this ring beta lactam ring have you heard of things like this right so what happen actually we use the penicillin to kill the bacteria but destroy the bacterial cell walls you must be knowing this thing is that right now sometimes what happens that plasmids some plasmids may have a special gene and when this gene expresses itself it make messenger rna and that messenger rna translate into a protein and that protein look at it this is that protein what that protein can do what is happening this protein produced by the plasmid can destroy the beta lactam ring and when beta lactam ring is destroyed do you think penicillins can work no what should be the name of this enzyme penicillinase or beta lactamase penicillinase or beta lactamase so some of the plasmids attention carry the genes to produce the enzymes which can destroy our antibiotic so bacteria is happily producing disease and whenever, whenever antibiotic come near bacteria produces enzymes and destroy the antibiotic structure and in this way bacteria become resistant to drugs so plasmids can also induce resistance in the bacteria against the drugs right so we can say that what are plasmids plasmids are extra chromosomal double stranded dna rings which are capable of multiplying independent of the chromosome even though plasmid have one more capability we'll discuss later they are so nasty sometimes they open their ring and become the part of our integrate into our dna right anyway we'll talk about that later right now plasmids are very important 
concepts of plasmid as infectious agent, but they don't produce infection directly. Just having plasmid in your body will not produce trouble. But plasmids may enter into your bacteria and increase the virulence of the bacteria and indirectly produce the disease. Am I clear? Any question you have? No. Bacteriophages. What are bacteriophages? Yes, doctor. And how they are related with the disease or infectious disease? Oh my God, she told me that the bacteriophage is an organism. Or it is not an organism. It means after a few minutes I will talk about uh, virus is organism or not? No. no. Not. Organisms usually have cells. Yes. Right? Bacteria is an organism of course. Yes. Okay. Let's come back. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you how the bacteriophages have a role as in the infectious diseases. Have you heard of a bacteria called Corini bacterium diphtheria. This bacteria is sometimes normally present in some healthy people throat. Now, Corini bacterium diphtheria, right, diphtheria bacillus can be present in two types. Look here. This is diphtheria bacteria, Corini bacterium diphtheria. But it is not producing any toxin, right? Because it does not produce any exotoxin, it is not capable of producing the disease diphtheria. Is that right? Now what happens? Bacteriophages are special type of viruses. Let us, I'm going to make a bacteriophage here. This is a bacteriophage. What bacteriophage is doing? Bacteriophage has special type of DNA in it and whenever it get a chance it will stick to some bacteria make a hole and inject its DNA to the where okay I'll make it different color so you don't confuse it with plasmid <laughs> bacteriophages are special type of virus which are having genetic material and these viruses uh, interact with bacteria and how do they interact bacteriophages can inject their genetic material into bacteria now this is bacteriophage genetic material bacteriophage genetic material may have special type of genes what was this bacteria Corini bacterium diphtheria is that right and this diphtheria bacillus without this genetic material was not pathogenic. This was not dangerous bacteria. But as soon as bacteriophage, bacteriophage is a virus which is capable of injecting its genetic material into a bacteria. This is a very special type of bacteriophage which has attacked this bacterium and injected its genetic material and genetic material of this bacteriophage had a special gene. This gene is called tox gene. Tox gene. And this, when this gene expresses itself, a special protein is produced, and that proteins are being secreted by this bacteria, and these proteins are called diphtheria toxins. Diphtheria exotoxins. And these are responsible to produce the damage in the tissue. And the, the, these exotoxins produce what? Disease called diphtheria. Now, by this thing you can understand, if this bacteriophage is not there, if this bacteriophage and its genetic material is not there, can this uh, bacterium can produce with these? No. Is that right? Because bacterial chromosome does not have the gene to pro and capability to produce a diphtheria toxin. So every Corini bacterium uh, diphtheria does not produce disease. Only those diphtheria rods are toxic which have this type of genetic material from bacteriophage. Am I clear? So it means bacteriophage have also something to do with the infectious diseases even though indirectly. Am I clear? No problem? Now so you understand bacteriophages can bring the genetic material. Plasmids are themselves genetic material. Of course this is extra chromosomal. 
transposons. What are transposons? I'm about to be impressed by someone. What are transposons? Transposons are the sons of transporters. You know, transporters are transporting the things. Their sons should be very mobile. Transposons are special type of DNA fragments we can, which can jump around. Let me tell you how. Even within a bacterium, let's suppose this is a bacterium, right? This is bacterial DNA, right? Here is your friend plasmid, right? Transposons are special type of double-stranded DNA. This is that genetic sequence which is called transposons. I should show that they are having the legs also because they keep on jumping around. Actually, these DNA fragments have a very special capacity. They can leave from this point and go within the same chromosome at other point or they may leave from this and go to the plasmid and from the plasmid they may go to another chromosome. So these are also called jumping genes. What are they called? Jumping genes, transposons, the sons of transporters. They are very, very mobile. We can also call them mobile genes, right? So these mobile genes have to do with the disease also something, with the infection. If transposon is having some genes which are related with virulence factor, for example, transposons are having a gene which can produce toxins or some adhesins or some other protein which can be related with the virulence factor. And if transposons jump from one bacterium, for example, transposons jump from this chromosome, bacterial chromosome to plasmid, and then from the, then plasmid goes to another bacterium. So then the new bacterium will acquire new characteristics due to arrival of this transposons. You are understanding? They are using the plasmid as a transporter, transport system, right? And in this way, they can spread within the population of bacteria and alter the pathogenicity of bacteria. <laughs> Am I clear? Okay. So after that, we come to the next infectious agent category. We have talked about prions, which are just proteins. We have talked about plasmids and transposons, which are just genetic material. Virus. Have you heard of another things called virioids? Okay, I will write them here. Uh, virioids. What are virioids? Have you heard of this word or not? The good news is that if you don't know them, it doesn't matter much. But still for a concept I will tell you. Virioids are naked. I think your mind is too much alert right now. They are naked RNA molecules. They are naked infectious RNA molecules. Infectious RNA molecules. I will not go into detail of that. You know why? Because it produces diseases only into plants. And my doctors are not supposed to treat the plants. Right? So we'll ignore them. But just for an interest, that viroids are infectious RNA molecules. And if one plant gets some of these infectious RNA molecules, these RNA molecules will multiply a lot and produce damage to the plant. Is that right? And they are naked. What, what, what does it mean by naked? The life stripped is or what? Yes. Naked. Someone has uh, undressed them? Yeah, they don't have any proteins. That's it. Virus are, you know, dressed into proteins. And sometimes they have extra dress of the uh, lipid layer also. We call them enveloped virus. Right? But transpo uh, these uh, viriates are really naked. Right? But thank God they are only in romantic love with plants. Now we come to the viruses. Virus are what type of organisms? Yes, ma'am. Virus are what type of organisms? Virus are what type of organisms? Yes. No, no. The, he is very serious to answer. Virus are what type of organisms? First of all, very good. Virus are not organisms. Virus are not living. 
virus are not living agents they are infectious agent of course but they are not alive is that right organisms are made of cells virus are not having the cell virus are just some genetic material dna or rna with some protein cover that's it right viruses are primarily they have dna or rna for example this is dna or virus may have rna and okay virus may have dna or they may have yes rna double stranded or single stranded and with that they are having what protein cover right protein cover is that right this is the basic structure of virus the what is virus dna and no there is never end either there is dna or rna dna and rna are not present in a virus is that right but all other cells prokaryotes and eukaryotes they have dna and rna but virus are different in a hallmark way they have either dna or rna so dna or i should put it in red so i know you are attracted to red things and you'll remember dna or rna with a what thing protein cover is that right this is the basic structure of virus and some virus may have additional dressing and what is this lipid bilayer this is called envelope is that right some viruses are enveloped others are not enveloped but virus are basically a particles having dna or rna with a protein cover this genetic material with protein cover is called nucleo nucleo capsid this dna or rna with the protein cover is called nucleo capsid right but of course virus does not have any nucleus right and some of the virus have additional what lipid layer is that right now question is that first of all why virus are not called cells it means you must you have very clear concept what is a cell dr sunny is coming with the answer okay there are no organelles but listen organelles are not present in bacteria but bacteria are cell the bacteria are cell isn't it bacteria don't have golgi bodies or lysosomes or mitochondria they cannot replicate by themselves some bacteria some bacteria cannot replicate independently okay i want what is the concept how virus are different from bacteria first of all you must know what is cell because simply you say virus is non cellular infectious agent is that right what is cell please because all microbiology is around these things what are prokaryotes what are eukaryotic infectious agent how you are treating them cell it's very simple cell is any structure having nucleus or nucleoid nucleus nucleus or nucleoid i will tell later on what is nucleoid actually when genetic material is present in a cell membrane this is called oh, sorry when genetic material is having a nuclear membrane this is called nucleus when genetic material is present in some cell but dna chromosome does not have any nuclear membrane around it it is called nucleoid listen again carefully in a cell when chromosomes are present within a membrane that structure is called nucleus but in a cell as it happen in bacteria in bacterial cells there is no nuclear membrane but nuclear but genetic material like bacterial chromosome is present so the place where genetic chromosome or bacterial in within the bacteria where bacterial chromosome is present that point is not called nucleus that is called nucleoid so bacteria do not have nucleus they have nucleoid so of course bacteria are also cell so what is cell cell is a structure having a nucleus or nucleoid surrounded by surrounded by cyto 
प्लाजम यस एंड अ प्लाज्मा मेम्ब्रेन अ सेल मेम्ब्रेन एंड साइटोप्लाज्म यस साइटोप्लाज्म इज कैपेबल ऑफ सिंथेसाइजिंग प्रोटीन इट शुड है मशीनरी फॉर प्रोटीन सिंथेसिस लाइक राइबोजोम एंड शुड बी कैपेबल ऑफ प्रोवाइडिंग एनर्जी इट्स द बेसिक कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ सेल दट एनी स्ट्रक्चर विच इज हैविंग न्यूक्लियस और न्यूक्लियाइड सराउंडेड बाय द साइटोप्लाज्म एंड अ मेम्ब्रेन एंड दैट साइटोप्लाज्म इज विद फ्यू एक्सेप्शन देर आर सम फ्यू एक्सेप्शन दैट साइटोप्लाज्म इज कैपेबल ऑफ having the machinery to synthesize proteins and also provide energy that is the cell do you think virus have ribosomes to synthesize the proteins do they have mitochondria or any other energy mechanisms so virus are not cells am i clear and virus are not living organisms because outside the cells virus are as alive as a sand grain sand grain has no metabolic activity you are understanding sand grain no metabolic activity virus also outside the cell no metabolic activity they don't have any protein synthetic activity they do not have any energy producing capabilities so virus are not cells they are non cellular infectious agents of course up to now all of them were non cellular isn't it prions were not cellular plasmids were not cellular virus are not cellular but we are going gradually to more complex situation right until you will end up with very big 10 meter tape worm right so what i'm talking about virus has either dna or rna number 1 number 2 they are having a protein cover right protein cover may give a structure to virus which is icosahedral or give a structure to virus which is helical and some viruses are enveloped and others are not enveloped is that right from where the virus gets the envelope yes yeah actually when virus enter into cell multiply when virus are leaving the cell they steal away a piece of cell membrane for example look here this is a hepatocyte this is a hepatocyte these are new viruses here when these viruses will escape they may take a piece of the our own cell membrane and this membrane is basically envelop and envelop is the stolen stolen pieces of membranes taken away from the cells from where virus have escaped every virus is not thief only few virus steal our membranes they are called enveloped virus because they are enveloped into stolen membranes and other are naked they don't care right so they don't steal right what do you think which virus are okay that i will teach you and that is a complex concept which i came in i was going to teach i will teach you in virology so this was something about virus right you are very clear why virus are not considered alive organisms and you are very clear why virus are not considered cells am i clear okay let's have a break so we were talking about the groups of infectious agents we have discussed already about the prions which are just protein particles then we talked about plasmids transposons which are genetic material virus we talked about that they are just particles which are having the dna or rna having a protein cover over that and some of them are enveloped by a lipid membrane right after that now we come to bacteria and when we talk about bacteria bacteria of course very important infectious agents and i will now compare bacteria with other agents and more complex than bacteria there are yes fungus fungi and 
and yes after that there are larger organisms what are these who will tell me protozoa protozoa and then there are larger helminths means right which are multicellular worms parasitic worms and of course there is one more group very important which you must know they are ectoparasites they are called ecto para sites right in which there are even insects for example scabies there are insects right in in insects you can say there can be lice they are also producing infection related problems right and lice or fleas or mites and ticks anyway ectoparasites will talk later the point which you have to understand that from here onward all of them are made of cells is that right bacteria are cell fungi are cell protozoa are cell helminths have multicellular and of course ectoparasites are also cells right and there is a major difference in bacteria and other cells bacteria are made of special special type of cells which are called pro karyoids and all other belong to a category which is called u karyoids right so before i really go into detail of every group i would like that we should develop our concept of what is the real difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotic right human cells are eukaryotic right and let me make one bacterium here which is representing a pro karyotic cells and let's make one okay let's put here a human cell which is eukaryotic cells is that right now we are looking this is prokaryotic cells belonging to bacteria this is going to represent a typical eukaryotic cell which may be fungus or protozoa or helminth or ectoparasites or even it can represent a human cell now let's see what is the real difference in the prokaryotes and u karyoids the first of all we'll start working in the difference from within from genetic material outward prokaryotes and u karyoids now first of all prokaryotes do not have a true nucleus when we say u karyoid u mean true karyon mean nucleus when we say a cell is eukaryotic cell it means it is having a true nucleus well defined nucleus when we say a cell is prokaryotic actually we mean that it is not having a true nucleus it has some structure like nucleus but not a true or not a definitive nucleus is that right this is one thing secondly now let's study the genetic material in both cells bacteria have how many chromosomes one and eukaryotic cell they have multiple chromosomes this is one difference there is one chromosome here and there are multiple chromosomes there number 2 chromosome in prokaryotic cells are circular chromosomes are circular and here the chromosomes are linear here the chromosomes are linear again listen prokaryotic cell they have single chromosome eukaryotic cell they have multiple chromosome prokaryotic cell they have 
chromosome which is circular eukaryotic cell the chromosome which is yes linear now another difference you, all of you must be knowing the eukaryotic cells are having dna which is single stranded or double stranded double stranded human dna is double stranded isn't it so in eukaryotic cells dna present in the chromosome is double stranding stranded right in the nucleus and dna in bacteria is single stranded or double stranded miguel please we were talking about the we were comparing the prokaryote with eukaryote single chromosome multiple chromosomes circular chromosome linear chromosomes is that right here there are double stranded dna molecule and sunny is going to tell us here there are single stranded write it down and put a very big cross look here is it looking double stranded or single stranded look at the diagram double stranded please remember dna in eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells both are double stranded is that right this is not a difference this is similarity am i clear then of course around the dna there are special proteins as in human those proteins are called histones you know histones histones are special type of group of proteins on which dna is wrapped double stranded dna is wrapped on the histones is that right so pro eukaryotic cells have dna double stranded dna wrapped on histone proteins prokaryotic cells have also double stranded dna but do not have histones but do not have histones is that right then there is another difference in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells dna you know in human dna or all other eukaryotic dna they have in the genes exons and introns you have the concept of exons and introns right let us suppose this is double stranded dna right and in this dna let's suppose here is a gene here is a gene promoter box and here is the gene dna is a double stranded molecule in eukaryotic cells and in a very long molecule of dna there may be multiple genes there may be multiple genes now in eukaryotic genes some part of the gene is expressed which is called exons and some of them are not expressed which are called interons and then there are areas which are expressed called exons right so what really happens that in eukaryotic dna eukaryotic cells have very abundant dna right so there are exons and introns both exons are those part of the genetic material right that their messenger rna eventually gets translated into peptide amino acid peptide sequence and introns are the regions in between the exons that corresponding rna to introns is removed and introns do not code for any amino acid am i clear or i should really make it more clear are you clear about it introns and exons look but you know bacteria prokaryotes they don't have so abundant dna to have the luxury of introns so their all dna is yeah within the genes they don't have introns they don't have intervening regions they have exons only so another difference here they in the dna sequence exons only in eukaryote exons and introns both here double stranded dna there also double stranded dna this is a similarity 
here double stranded DNA in a circular molecule, here double stranded DNA in a linear molecule. Here histones are not present, some other proteins are there, there histones are present. Here this is single chromosome, there it is multiple chromosomes. And then of course, when you have multiple chromosomes and more complex genetic machinery, you need to have a nuclear membrane and here you don't need to have a nuclear membrane here is just dna with some rna some enzymes like rna polymerases right but this prokaryon prokaryotic cells do not have a nuclear membrane because they do not have a nuclear membrane so this structure cannot be called nucleus because it's not a true nucleus so this structure is just called nucleoid what it is called? Nucleoid. Am I clear to you? No problem into this? Now listen carefully. I am going to give a statement and only very good student can really tell statement is true or not. Listen to the statement carefully. In eukaryotic cells like human cells, in eukaryotic cells all the DNA is present as linear chromosomes with exons and introns. Is this true or not? Again let me tell you. I will repeat statement. In human cells or eukaryotic cells which may be fungi, protozoa, helminth, ectoparasites or even any multicellular organism, right? In eukaryotic cells statement is all the DNA is in linear chromosomes. Yes. Is it true or not? People who believe this statement is true, raise their hands. Okay, Miguel is there, Jose is there, Wilhelm is there, Vyagne and another lady there, two ladies rather. Okay, people who believe this statement is wrong. Okay, Sunny and Israel think this statement is wrong. Why you think it is wrong statement? Do you think human cell has DNA which is not linear? Thank God your answer is not being recorded. Okay, uh, let me explain. He is right, but he doesn't know why he is right. <laughs> okay, first of all, listen carefully. When I said all the DNA, all the DNA which is present in human cell is double stranded linear, the statement is wrong. You know why? Of course, all the DNA which is present within the nucleus of human cells that is like this double stranded DNA with linear chromosomes. But there is DNA also present in cytoplasm. Now, Miguel Diaz is going to impress me by telling in the cytoplasm where DNA is present. Yes, normally, physiologically. Have you heard of something called mitochondria, my friend? What are mitochondria? Mitochondria are energy producing bacteria. Millions and millions of the years back, some energy producing bacteria enter into prokaryotic cells for nutrition and protection. And we were very glad to host them. This is a welcome guest. Mitochondria were energy producing bacteria. They came into eukaryotic cells. Is that right? And they provide us with energy and we provide them with a lot of nutrition and sport and they are good for us. It's a very beautiful relationship. Is that right? So actually if I make a mitochondrion here, this is a mitochondria, you know it has a double membrane. Is that right? Mitochondria has if it is energy producing bacteria, it must have its own genes, its own genetic material and that should be like bacterial. So we have energy producing bacteria in our cells. Of course we don't call them bacteria. Now they are called mitochondrion now. Every mitochondrion has its own genetic material. It's having its own genes. Even you must have heard of inherited diseases related with mitochondrial genetic material. Have you heard of it? 
and of course mitochondria is present in cytoplasm. So this genetic material must be present in cytoplasm. Is that right? Am I clear to everyone? So we can say that all the genetic material present in the eukaryotic cells nucleus it double stranded linear chromosomes. But we must remember eukaryotic cells have mitochondrions and these mitochondria are having their own genetic material which has lot of similarity with bacterial genetic material. Should I tell you what are the mitochondrial and bacterial similarities? Okay. Chromosome in the bacteria is circular. Chromosomal material in mitochondria is circular. Genetic material in bacteria has only exons, no introns. Genetic material of mitochondria has only exons, no, int no introns. Genetic material in bacteria do not have histones. Genetic material in mitochondria also does not have histones. Am I clear? No problem up to this? Right. Anyway, let's come back. So we were talking about that prokaryotes and eukaryotic difference. We have just talked about this thing that prokaryotes have nucleoids and eukaryotes have proper nucleus, right? Now we come to another thing that in case of eukaryotes, there are also nucleolus. But prokaryotes do not have nucleolus. You know nucleolus is a special region within the nucleus where ribosomal RNA and ribosomal proteins are synthesized and assembled. This type of arrangement, well defined arrangement is not present in the nucleus of bacteria because bacteria do not have nucleus. Is that right? Now who will rapidly tell me the differences here and there? Yes. Okay, here is nuclear envelope, envelope there is no envelope. So this is nucleus, this is nucleoid, nucleoid. Double stranded DNA here, double stranded DNA here. Linear chromosome, circular chromosome. Multiple chromosome, single chromosome. Uh, histones with chromosome DNA, no histones. DNA with introns and exons, only with exons. Is that right? And nucleolus is present there and it is not present over there. Any question up to this? This is no. Okay, now we come to the other differences between the eukaryotes and prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, there are ribosomes and prokaryotes also have ribosomes. But there is a difference of ribosome. The ribosomes which are present here, right, that is 60S and 40S. Total it is called 80S. Don't think my mathematics is not okay. 60 plus 40 make 100. But actually it is called ATS. Why? Anyone? These are very basic things my friends. Look, this uh, is Swedberg unit. These, these units, 60S mean these are the unit which tell you how fast this fragment will se sediment into when there is centrifugation. When you do contents of the cytoplasm, uh, cytoplasm uh, put into centrifuge, right? You see that on centrifugation with which speed it goes down. That depends on multiple factors on its mass as well as molecular weight and many other factor. The, the speed with which it sediment that is called Swedberg unit. Is that right? Now this goes down with speed of 60. This goes down with the speed of 40 but when they are together they go with down with the speed of 80 that is why 60 plus 40 60 s plus 40 s unit do not make the 100 they make the 80 so 80 s as the ribosome of eukaryotic cells and ribosomes here what is this this is uh, 50 s n 30s but it makes 70s. I think it's 70s isn't it? Okay. Is it right? Do you think I'm very messy that is such a detail I'm telling you? Do you think this detail is important to know that ribosomes here have 70s ribosomes uh, there are what, what is the importance of knowing this? Excellent. Miguel is so right that 
because prokaryotic ribosomal machinery is different than the eukaryotic ribosomal machinery so the drugs which interfere drugs which interfere with the function of prokaryotic ribosomes they do not interfere with the eukaryotic ribosomal function so in this way we have many antibiotics which will hit the function of bacterial ribosomes without interfering with the human ribosomal structure is that right and if we come up end up with a drug which can destroy the function of bacterial ribosome as well as human ribosome of course that is not drug that is toxin is that right am i clear so this is very important to know that ribosomal structure in prokaryotic cells is different and eukaryotic cell is different right eukaryotic cells have little larger ribosomes any other differences there in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells it's a very big difference membrane bound organelles there are many membrane bound organelles present in which cells eukaryotic but not in prokaryotic classically you know your friends what are these mitochondrions they have double membrane mitochondria are present in eukaryotic cells but mitochondria are not present in prokaryotic cells of course all of you must be knowing mitochondria are responsible to generate energy oxidative phosphorylation enzymes and many energy related enzyme and machinery is present in mitochondria how the bacteria produces energy if it does not have if it does not have mitochondria look in human cells or fungus cell or protozoa cell helminth cells or ectoparasite cells mitochondria are producing energy uh, bacteria do not have mitochondria how do they produce energy no you have to be more intelligent sometimes anyone well, very simple this, this is bacterial cell membrane i told you mitochondria are just bacteria is it right so actually as in the mitochondria here are the what are these enzymes related with the electron transport chain system oxidative phosphorylation here the oxidative phosphorylation proteins are present on the inner side of the membrane of bacterial cell that's so simple am i clear mechanisms are somewhat similar right okay so we talked about membrane bound organelles let's talk about lysosomes there are lysosomes present in eukaryotic cells but prokaryotic cells do not have lysosomes do not have mitochondria right then of course you should not forget very complex and very extensive membrane system in the cells called endoplasmic reticulum endoplasmic reticulum is present yet is a network of interconnecting tubes right are present into eukaryotic cells endoplasmic reticulum endoplasmic reticulum is not present in prokaryotic cells is that right that is why all the ribosomes which are present in prokaryotic cells are free ribosomes right but here some ribosomes may be free and some may be bound with endoplasmic reticulum and that of course endoplasmic reticulum is called rough endoplasmic reticulum is that right any more difference in these two golgi operators that's great that golgi operators is present in eukaryotic cell but golgi operators is not present in prokaryotic cells is that right okay another very interesting thing in some books it's mentioned that messenger rna in eukaryotic cell is monocystronic mono cystronic messenger rna but messenger rna in bacteria may be mono or poly cystronic 
मैसेंजर आरएनए व्हाट इज दिस कांसेप्ट मानो सिस्ट्रोनिक मैसेंजर आरएनए एंड हाउ इट इज डिफरेंट फ्रॉम पोली सिस्ट्रोनिक मैसेंजर आरएनए यस प्लीज एनीवन एनीवन मानो सिस्ट्रोनिक मीन विद वन सिस्टर एंड पोली सिस्ट्रोनिक मीन मल्टीपल सिस्टर्स समवन एज अ बेटर कांसेप्ट I think you people are very uh, trying to hide your knowledge. You are not having gasoline right now. Okay, I understand. I never knew you run on gas, but you can put your finger in plug. Maybe you run on electricity. <laughs> okay, uh, let me tell you what is really this concept. when messenger rna comes out of a nucleus let's suppose this is messenger rna which come out i'm going to draw this here this is messenger rna right here from this codon it start inauguration of it start from here amino acid sequences start putting the corresponding amino acids right and here is the stop codon what is it stop codon and this you can say start codon and okay within the messenger rna this is a very special sequence of what is this of course rna within the messenger rna there is a very special sequence of rna and with this sequence actually 30s unit bind ribosomal unit bind when messenger rna comes okay i'll give it a different color so you really understand it more clearly this is messenger rna from here up to here right in the messenger rna there is a very special type of sequence and with this sequence messenger rna stabilizes on the ribosome it attaches with the ribosome and then other component of ribosome also come and then ribosome starts sweeping over it and then ribosomes are moving on the messenger rna they start reading and translating messenger rna sequence into peptide chain now ribosomes assemble both unit of ribosome assemble on this special sequence then they start translating from start codon and they finish translation at stop codon and disassemble and then again come back and move like that in this way they start making peptide chains am i clear anyone who is not clear about it this concept is discussed in detail in uh, genetics video but anyway now this sequence is very important if the sequence is not there messenger rna will not bind with ribosome and ribosomal system will not organize on messenger rna and translation will not occur what is the name of this sequence this is called shain dalgarno sequence shain dalgarno sequence is that right so messenger rna now in eukaryotic cells one messenger rna usually have one shain Dal dalgarno sequence within the messenger rna and one messenger rna produces one type of peptide am i clear now we come to the bacterial messenger rna some of the bacterial messenger rna is different look at it this is bacterial messenger rna right but it has multiple shain dalgarno sequences one shain dalgarno sequence then another shain dalgarno sequence then maybe an other shain dalgarno sequence so it means that ribosome can assemble here in the bacteria and from here they can read up to this and disassemble make one peptide they can reassemble here read this frame and make another different peptide they can assemble here and read and make another different peptide so it means one messenger rna in bacteria may have coding for multiple different peptides right but in humans or in eukaryotes one messenger rna codes only for one peptide 
So when one messenger RNA is coding only for one peptide, we say it is monocystionic messenger RNA. When one messenger RNA sequence can code for multiple peptides, we call it polycystionic messenger RNA. And of course, polycystionic messenger RNA will have multiple Shine-Dalgarno sequences. Am I clear? No problem into this, right? So bacteria have some of messenger RNAs which are monocystionic, other messenger RNAs which are polycystionic. But in eukaryotic cells, all the messenger RNAs are monocystionic. Is that right? Now, after that, what other differences are present in the prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cell? A very important difference is present, especially the way they divide. Look, bacteria has only one chromosome. When bacteria is going to divide, DNA will replicate from one chromosome, it will make two chromosomes and this bacterial cell will divide into two cells. So each cell will get one chromosome. Is that right? This is simple way to divide. So let's come to a human cell. Do you think it has one chromosome or lot of multiple chromosomes? Yes? Multiple chromosomes. Of course, every chromosome before division of the cell will be duplicated. Is that right? All the DNA will be replicated. But when you have to make two daughter cell, you have to very carefully divide all the chromosomes in such a way that one copy of each chromosome should go to one cell and one co other copy of each chromosome should go to the other cell. So do you think division of genetic material is simple in bacteria or simple in eukaryotic cells? Simple in bacteria. So because in eukaryotic cells there are multiple chromosomes, so when cell is going to divide, we need to arrange the chromosome in a very specific fashion before we really divide them into two cells. For that purpose, eukaryotic cells make mitotic spindle. What do you think? So mitotic spindle, we arrange the chromosomes and then mitotic spindle divides the chromosome appropriately, multiple chromosome, right? One copy of each chromosome going to each daughter cell. But do you think we need a special spindle here? No. So there is mitotic spindle, mitotic figure seen in eukaryotic cells. Are you expecting to see mitotic figures or spindles in bacteria? No. Am I clear? So we say the eukaryotic cells divide by mitosis and of course you are very intelligent. Those cells which are going to be germ cells, they will divide by meiosis. But bacteria don't have mitotic spindle, so they don't undergo mitosis or meiosis type things. Am I clear? No problem into this? And of course another thing, I remember that I must mention, the DNA in bacteria continuously replicate. But DNA in humans does not continuously replicate. You know when DNA is going, when cell is going to divide, the eukaryotic cell pass through G1 stage, then there is S phase in which synthesis of DNA occur, then there is G2 stage, then there is M stage, all these stages are seen in eukaryotic cells, but they are not seen in bacterial cells. Bacteria divide by simple binary fission, right? But these cells don't divide by binary fissions, they undergo mitotic situation. Here is a little bit exception. Fungi, especially in the yeast, they, go, they grow by budding or mold go by mitosis, right? But classically speaking, typically speaking, eukaryotic cells display the mitotic process for division of the cells, but they are having binary fission. So replication of bacteria by binary fission, replication or division of eukaryotic cells by Mitosis or meiosis, replication of virus, yes. Mitosis or meiosis or binary fission? None of them. What do you mean? Virus don't uh, replicate? Okay, some bacteria also need the host. How the replication of virus is different from bacteria, prokaryotes and eukaryotes? I'm about to be impressed by someone. 
Look, virus do not have binary fission, they do not have what is that? Mitosis or meiosis because the principle of principle of binary fission and mitosis and meiosis is parent cell divide into two daughter cell without losing the cellular structure. The principle is that in, during binary fission and during what is this funny thing? Eukaryotic cells when they divide either by binary fission or by mitosis and meiosis when these cells prokaryotic or eukaryotic divide one parent cell divide into two daughter cells without losing cellular structure. But when we come to virus, virus are too simple to be called cell, right? Virus simply if this is the host cell, right? Virus will simply inject, disassemble itself, its proteins will become separate, and virus genetic material will come in. <coughs> So virus, when they are going to replicate, first of all, they disassemble themselves on or in the host cell. Then within the host cell, they make multiple copies of their genetic material and multiple copies of their protein, proteins, and then they reassemble. So viral replication is disassembly and reassembly. Prokaryote replication is binary fission. Eukaryote is classically mitosis and in some cases meiosis. Yes, my friend. Okay, he is saying that viral replication occurs in cytoplasm or in the nucleus. We will talk in detail about that when we talk about virology because different viruses uh, are having different sites. That is why I was a little clever. I say in the host cell. Some of them in cytoplasm, some of them in nucleus. Right? Am I clear? So virus does not have a cell and during the beginning it does not maintain any cellular structure. Claro? No problem? Right. After this any other difference between the prokaryotes and eukaryotes? Okay. Prokaryotes are bacteria. Is that right? What are other organisms which are prokaryotes? Is there any other organism also prokaryotes or bacteria are only prokaryotes? Let's Okay, Dr. Vyagne is saying LG is prokaryotes. No, they are uh, pro uh, unicellular, eukaryotic cells. LG, yeah. Uh, up to last hours, they were eukaryotic. Yes. Pro, any other, uh, Sunny, you may tell us. Do you think there are any other organisms which are also prokaryotes or prokaryotes or only bacteria? Anyone who has some confidence to answer this question? I will give an interesting statement. All the organisms which are prokaryotes are called bacteria. You understand me? All the organisms which are prokaryotes are called bacteria. So of course, all bacteria are prokaryotes and if there is anything else which is prokaryote, should be bacteria. So don't be confused in future that is it other than anything bacteria, is it prokaryote or eukaryote? There is no fun in thinking. Anything in the world which is prokaryote is called bacteria. Is that right? Now another difference in prokaryote and eukaryotes. That is about the cell wall. Bacteria have cell wall. There is only one exception. There is only one bacteria which does not have cell wall. Which one is that one? Yes. Which bacteria does not have a cell wall? Mycoplasma. Right? But other than mycoplasma, every bacteria has a cell wall. Right? Classically, bacterial cell walls are made of, typically, bacterial cell walls are made of peptidoglycans. Glycans mean sugar. They are long rods of sugars. These green rods are sugar rods. These green rods are sugar backbones. These are glycans. What are these? Yes, glycans. I will discuss into detail peptidoglycans later on. But just here for introduction that a typical bacteria is surrounded by rods of sugars cross-linked by peptide chains. Cross-linked by
peptide chains and this arrangement is called peptido glycans so typical bacteria classical bacteria have peptido glycans around them right eukaryotic cells do not have peptido glycan right most of the eukaryotic cells even do not have a cell wall cell wall is present in fungi and that is not made of peptidoglycan that is made of chitin right again listen no eukaryote has a cell wall of peptidoglycan rather most of the eukaryotic cells do not have cell wall the only eukaryotic which have cell wall is fungi and their cell wall is different than bacterial cell wall their cell wall is made of chitin what is this if it is fungus then it is chitin what is this chitin so peptidoglycan structure is only present on bacteria that is why all those drugs which disrupt the peptidoglycan structure they are antibacterial they cannot be used as antiviral or they cannot be used as antifungal or can you penicillin or cephalosporins these are two cell wall active agents for bacteria what are other cell wall active agents i'm about to be impressed by someone penicillins cephalosporins histronam vancomycin very good and <laughs> imipenem you have heard of imip imipenem yeah right so these are cell wall active agents these are actually truly speaking peptidoglycan disruption agents i will discuss into detail later how they inhibit the cell wall synthesis but they are only antibacterial why because peptidoglycan is present only in the bacteria is that right but the same drugs cannot be antifungal because fungus does not have peptidoglycan it has chitin they cannot be anti protozoal cell wall active agent because protozoa do not have peptidoglycans am i clear now why the bacteria have this peptidoglycan thing because not only it gives a shape to bacteria not only it gives shape to, to the bacteria not only it gives the rigidity to bacteria it is very important because here the cytoplasm of bacteria is hyperosmotic it will absorb the water it will absorb the water and the bacterial cell will swell up to prevent the undue swelling nature has provided the bacteria with what is this peptidoglycan cover so that it does not really keep on when bacteria new daughter bacteria are made when new bacteria are made new bacteria fresh bacteria baby bacteria do not have hyperosmotic cytoplasm but new baby bacteria start secreting peptidoglycans and start making cell wall when they are making cell wall as they are maturing new bacteria are maturing as they are making the cell wall their cytoplasm become hyperosmotic is that right now what penicillins are doing we'll discuss in detail later on but usually cell wall active agents disrupt the synthesis of what is this cell wall so what happens when bacteria are rapidly multiplying they are making baby bacteria and when baby bacteria are in the environment where penicillin those phallosporin the working baby bacteria cannot make the proper peptidoglycan networks so baby bacteria keep on maturing keep on making their cytoplasm hyperosmotic keep on absorbing the water but there is no peptidoglycan network to prevent the osmotic swelling so what happens bacteria keep on swelling swelling and until they undergo osmotic burst it's a very cruel way to kill a bacteria but that is what we are doing it's almost terrorism against the human rights if you let the bacteria absorb the water and it keep on swelling swelling and doze right because bacterial cell membrane is not strong why bacterial cell membrane is not strong because it does not have sterols now you may be thinking why dr najib is fussy about sterols let me tell you the only bacteria which does not have cell wall is mycoplasma 
and mycoplasma has sterol in cell membrane which give it tensile strength so that mycoplasma does not undergo osmotic burst. You are understanding it. And even human cells are also having sterols. Sterols are present in all eukaryotic cell membranes. Sterols. They give the tensile strength to the membrane so that cells don't undergo osmotic burst. Bacterial cell membranes do not have sterols, so they have a tendency to undergo osmotic burst. But it is prevented by cell wall of the bacteria. Am I clear? The only bacteria which has sterol is yes, mycoplasma. Is that right? No problem into this. Another thing, the sterols which are present in cell membrane of fungi, they are called ergosterol. Have you heard of it? Ergosterol. These are special sterols which are present in cell membranes of fungi. My friend, you should know that because there are many drugs like amphotericin B which attack the ergosterols of fungi and destroy the fungi. And human cells do not have ergosterol. So when all those antifungal drugs which are working on ergosterol will not damage the human cell membrane. Is that right? Human cell membranes have different sterols and now anyone can tell me what type of sterols are present in? Yes, what type of sterols are present in human cell membranes? It is not ergosterols because humans are not cholesterol. You understand it? Cholesterol is not always bad. Excess of it is bad like excess of so many other things. So cholesterol is present in human cell membranes and many other eukaryotic cell membranes, right? In the same way, ergosterol is present in fungal cell membranes and all these sterols provide strength to the cell membrane. That is why most of the eukaryotic cells survive without cell walls, right? So there's no fun in damaging the protozoa by the penicillins or sphalosporins because protozoa do not have peptidoglycans. They can go, go get, what about Okay, mycoplasma is sensitive to, my friend this question is going to you, mycoplasma is more sensitive to penicillins or sphalosporins. Okay, it goes to you my friend. Mycoplasma is more sensitive to penicillins or sphalosporins. He says uh, sphalosporins, he is wrong, what do you think? Penicillins and you are also wrong. Mycoplasma does not have a cell wall. <laughs> My friends, mycoplasma, it is just like that. I say a person who does not have an ear, he is sensitive to which type of ear cutter? <laughs> funny question and more funny answer, right? So mycoplasma does not have cell wall because in its membrane it has sterols. Am I clear? So mycoplasma does not need peptidoglycans. There is no fun in answering this question that any drug which is damaging the uh, peptidoglycan system will damage the mycoplasma. Are you understanding or not? Yeah. So, sphalosporins or penicillins or your friends like istronam, imipenem, imipenem or what is that, vancomycin, they are not used to kill the mycoplasma. Is that right? Because these are cell wall active agents and mycoplasma does not have cell walls. Will use other antibiotic to kill the mycoplasma, like the antibiotic which disrupt the ribosomes of mycoplasma. We'll talk about that somewhere in pharma. Am I clear? No problem up to this, right? Then, so you you came to know about bacteria. Then bacteria are classically divided into two types of bacteria: atypical bacteria, atypical small bacteria and then there are typical bacteria. What are atypical small bacteria? Small bacteria. Yes, atypical bacteria are those bacteria which are not typical bacteria because like typical bacteria, atypical may not have, they may have deficiency of some structural component or they may have deficiency of some metabolic processes. Can you tell me some atypical bacteria? Yes, my friends. Can you tell me some atypical bacteria? Why don't you tell me mycoplasma at least? It does not have a typical cell wall. What happened to you? Right? At least you must know three friends. 
which are atypical bacteria, small bacteria like mycoplasma, yes. What else? Chlamydia and rickettsia. Rickettsia. Right? Now, mycoplasma, chlamydia and rickettsia are not very typical. These are smaller organisms. Right? Mycoplasma does not have a cell wall. Atypical. Chlamydia cannot produce ATP. So it has to multiply intracellularly. In the same way, rickettsia also multiplies intracellularly. You must be knowing that rickettsia multiplies in the cytoplasm of endothelial cells of the capillaries. That is why it produces usually hemorrhagic situations like rocky mountain spotted fever. Have you heard of this thing? Right. We'll talk in detail later. Chlamydia is also multiplying intracellularly because it cannot multiply extracellularly. Right? Chlamydia is the most common cause of more, okay, uh, let me tell you, it's very important thing. Chlamydia is the most common infectious cause of female, female infertility. Why? Chlamydia produces scarring and narrowing of fallopian tubes. And of course, because fallopian tubes are only in females, so it is cause of female infertility. The most common infectious cause of female infertility is chlamydia. And you know chlamydia trachomatis is also most common infectious cause related with the blindness. Chlamydia trachomatis, you know that attacks the conjunctiva and produces trachoma and that produces scarring into what is this? Lids and when eyelids are scarred, they are distorted. And when they are distorted, some eyelashes may be directed inward. Those eyelashes keep on rubbing the cornea and inflammation of the cornea and scarring of cornea and blindness. Right? And mycoplasma, you know your friend, it produces typically pneumonia which is called atypical pneumonia. Right? Okay, while we are concluding this discussion and all other bacteria are typical, what is the tiniest living organism known up to now? The smallest living organism known up to now. Infectious organism. Yeah? Your friends? I don't believe that. What are the tiniest living organisms? Please tell me mycoplasma. That is the tiniest, smallest living organism, don't tell anyone virus. Virus is not organism because it does not have cell. It's not living. Is it right? Bacteria are living and when I say smallest living organism, that should be smallest bacteria. The smallest bacteria is mycoplasma, right? So remaining things we'll discuss later and go into detail of other things.